They don't care what your product does. Really, like they don't care. They, what they want to know is what it can do for them. And especially don't copy big brands. A lot of people will go and look at big brands website and they're going to say, look, they're doing this. It's working fine. But what you forget is these people. I'm excited for today's show because, you know, Dominic is somebody I've been following on X and I love the insights that he shares. And so, first of all, Dominic, thank you for being on this show. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do right now, and how you got to this place? Sure. First of all, my name is Dominic. I'm a Canadian living in the USA. Um, I'm a marketer uh, first. So I started as a sales guy when I was young. Then I moved on. I went into law school. Uh, then I dropped off. And I started my career as an entrepreneur. Um, I've built two SaaS company. Um, after I have some, uh, mild success with them. And after them, what I'm doing right now is I'm helping coaches and, uh, consultants get more clients with paid ads and funnels, marketing strategies. You said you started with sales. And the reason that was interesting or curious to me is because I see that a lot of successful entrepreneurs have some background in sales or marketing or advertising. My thesis, okay, is that, you know, it's just you know, a SaaS or building a product or building anything for that matter is only maybe half the piece of the puzzle. The other half is actually, you know, selling it, getting people to understand what it is and all of that. Is that a fair thesis? What do you think? Why, why do people who have a sales background seem to have more success as an entrepreneur? Um, well, I would say because you absolutely need sales to uh, sell the product that you're building. So it makes complete sense. But also because um, if you have a background in sales, I think you have more confidence that you could put something in the market. You're going to know how you're going to make money with it. Um, you're less shy maybe because you have some experience in the past by selling something. Uh, which is very crucial. Uh, and especially when you, you're doing SaaS, uh, it's a lot of uh, uh, coding. The product takes a lot of time to build usually. I mean, past the MVP, let's just say. And then um, we always forget that if you spend one hour building something, you're probably going to have to spend four or five hours to market it. And that's the part that people usually don't put don't put enough time to market their products. So if you have this mindset of marketing, you can kind of know where to position yourself in, in both sides. And I'm glad you said that, Dominic, because that is why I was so excited to have this conversation. We are going to have a masterclass today. So Dominic, what do you have for us? How do we understand or learn about product positioning? Where do we start? Yeah, so I thought to to divide this, this big question in five big points, let's just say. And the first one I want to start with is a build your audience. And nowadays, it's so easy with, with social media. You, you kind of just go on any social media you want, and you have to start producing content. You need to start to put yourself out there and really uh, seek out your audience, seek out who you, you can uh, market to if you have a product already. Or if you're still looking for something to sell, then you can ask this audience, these people on social media, could they be resonating with? Like, what can you sell to them? So the first step I would say is go out, build your own audience on every social media you want. Personally, I'm not, I'm, I like Twitter or, or X, but you can choose any any social media and you should really like start there because that's that's one of the mistakes I've done in the past. It's, it's so useful for them. It's such an unfair advantage. So anyone now can do this and should build an audience before anything else that's what i would say you know in fact one of the things i'm doing now is building an audience so this conversation yeah. that we are having the content that i'm putting out is because i've discovered that you know if like like they, there's this age-old question if you build a product and nobody knows about it did you still build anything of value <laughs> that's the yeah, question yeah. i ask myself and i totally agree with you that it's very very important today to build an audience i've seen a lot of SaaS founders or people who build products in paid ads, you know, as a way mm -hmm. to attract traffic or get traffic into their funnels. Uh, how do you think about that? And what is what do you think is the major difference between paying for traffic and building organic traffic? 
Um, the only difference is, well, first, paid ads cost money, but also it's going to get you people in the door faster. But there's also a problem with that. Like you're paying for people, but when you're building a SaaS, especially SaaS, any product, but especially a SaaS, usually at the beginning, it's not ready yet for an audience, meaning people will start interacting with it and there's a lot of bugs or maybe it doesn't solve a, a, a problem. So people are going to start using it and quickly go away because it's not ready and it's normal. So if you're using paid ads, it's good in one way that you're going to test your product super fast. You're going to know right away if it's good or not, but it, you're probably going to lose all these people. So if you're okay losing the money, I would say, okay, go with paid ads, but it's going to be short lived. You're going to get people in and right away, they're going to leave because your product is probably not ready. Or if it is, you know, we'll be left with one or two or five people. And then you can start like engaging with, with those people. But it's really, if you're ready to uh, pay that kind of money for that kind of traffic, as opposed to if you go with organic uh, ads, you just go out, you go out there yourself and you start to find some people. It costs zero money. You can have a better control of who's entering um, your your market or who is interacting with your product. And then you can test right away, talk with them. It's a little bit slower process, but maybe more deep with your audience as opposed with cold traffic that you don't know. And then just try it and they go out. So you know, that last part, what you said is something I recognize because I use run paid ads. I've done organic marketing as well. And what I've realized is no matter how much paid ads you do, you still need to do organic market marketing at the end of the day to, you know, keep these guys interested and keep them, you know, build trust, build a relationship and, you know, get them to flow through the rest of your funnel. So, you know, I realized that, hey, if I'm going to be spending all of this time and energy doing that, yep. why don't I do that from the beginning itself, right? Yeah. And there's also this concept of push versus pull marketing. I don't know if I'm saying it right. I've, I've, I've read about it briefly, but the basics is, you know, it's like going, standing on a street corner and say, hey, do you want a pamphlet? Do you want a pamphlet? Do you want a pamphlet? People are going to say, no, thank mm. you. And today, uh, you know, people are so averse to ads. Like, you know, even when we do a Google search, we skip the first two options and we click on the, the oh, organic yeah. result, right? Uh, and people are so averse to that versus you showing up regularly, building or creating content, you know, showing up organically. And then people are going to click on your content, they're going to feel like, hey, this is my decision to watch this guy or my decision to approach this guy. That means that guards are down. They want to, you know, they're, they're more open to change. They're more open to, you know, building a relationship with you. So uh, just my two cents also, guys, that if you if you're going to spend on paid ads, right, you're still going to have to do organic marketing. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. My might as well just do organic marketing from the get-go. And then whenever you need a boost or whenever you need, you know, something to happen fast, like organic, I mean, Dominic said, that's when paid marketing comes into play. Having said yeah. that, I don't know, Dominic, if you noticed this, but recently the cost of ads has also gone up tremendously. Previously on LinkedIn, for example, which is which has the highest ad spends, the, the minimum you need to have on there was 5,000 rupees in Indian currency of ads. Now it's 15,000. So 3x is mm. the minimum that you need to spend on, on LinkedIn. On Instagram, it was about 500 rupees per, per uh, you know, week. Now it's 500 rupees per day, which is the minimum that's, wow. uh, that adds up. So, uh, yeah, especially if you're just getting started building, you know, your, your platform, you are not going to have that kind of money to burn unless you have VC funding, which I don't recommend. We, that's a different topic. So, <laughs> yes. So let's talk about positioning and being organic in the way that, you know, we, we attract or reach and attract and build trust with customers. Is there any tips that you would give? Dominic, uh, about building an audience, something that, that you have seen to work in the past, something you've seen that doesn't work in the past. The way to do that is very simple. Uh, the famous Gary V, I think, coined the, the, the sentence, the first is like, instead of producing content, you should document. It. So whatever you do, especially if you're building a SaaS, you should document how you build it. Like what you do on a day to day basis when you're building your product or just if you've trying to find a product to sell, 
you should also document that. Like, what are you doing to try to find a, a marketplace, to find a, find a market to sell something to? What are you doing day to day to build your own audience if you want? Like, how many pieces of content you're building, how you, you go about building those pieces of content. So whatever you do, document it and just push it outside in the world and on any platform. And I think this is how you start. You just explain what you do on a day-to-day basis. And it's much more powerful than trying to just getting your, your audience on something you don't know about or you taking some piece of content online and you just like rewrite it and put it online. I think it's much more powerful if it's your personal experience and it's what you're doing on a day-to-day basis. My, I think what's very powerful also is to add your own your your own fear, your own insecurity, like your own, like, for example, if you're building a SaaS and you're like, oh, maybe I don't want to tell anyone what's my idea, like what I'm building right now, because your fear of you, people are going to steal your idea or something like that, which is very, uh, not, not real. It's not a real fear. Yeah. Like people won't steal your idea. Like you should always instead put your idea in the world. If anything, you're going to find maybe co-founders to join your idea because nobody is going to take an, just an idea and steal it from you because it's so much work to just put it into reality and people w- won't try that. You need to be very convinced that this is a great idea and only you think it's a great idea. So yeah. put your idea in the world. It's much better. And then you get some feedback. You get people saying, I think it's a great idea or maybe you should add this or Maybe you're going to find your first customers like that. And so that's how powerful it is to put your idea in the world and not fearing just telling what you're thinking. And you should always strive to, to, to share with people what you're doing. That's a very great way to get started. I remember, was it Alex Hormozzi who said, instead of saying how to, say how I, and then start your yes. uh, you know, piece of content so how i did this here's what i learned here's how i am thinking about these things because that's a very genuine way of creating you know a visibility for not only yourself but the work that you're doing and it gets people curious you know and that's how tribes are formed that's how leaders are born that's how products are sold so guys if you haven't yet thought about building an audience Build an audience first before you build your product. Like Dominic said, there's so many advantages. One last thing I want to leave with everyone. There's a book called Show Your Work by Austin Cleon. It's a small book, like maybe 100, 120 pages or something like that. You can probably read it in one sitting because half the pages are drawings or doodles. Uh, But in that book, uh, Show Your Work, and then the next book, Steal Like an Artist, and keep going. These three, it's a series of three books written by Austin Cleon, where he talks about how you can get started in a media or a visual first world, you know, uh, and start showing your work, how to steal like an artist, you know, not having to okay. stare at a blank canvas all, all the time. So if, for those of you who are thinking of building an audience, uh, my recommendation are these three books. So now that we've built our audience, what is the next part of positioning? All right. So the second point uh, I I put on my presentation, and it's from a book I read, and it's a, a very good book. It's called uh, Self Future. So the topic is you sell future and not feature, right? So okay. you can yeah. say like sell the transformation. Instead of going and if you're building a SaaS and you want to talk about your product, what it does, all the feature, all the cool thing, the automation, all that stuff, the reality is your customers really don't care. They don't care what your product does, really. Like, they don't care. They What they want to know is what it can do for them. Like, what kind of transformation your product will provide to them? Like, the best comparison is, like, if you're selling a fitness product. People don't care what your your product does. What they care about is probably how am I going to lose weight or how am I going to like build muscle? Yeah. That's the transformation yeah. they're looking for. And your product is supposed to provide these benefits, the transformation. In SaaS, usually it's always some kind of automation and people get really bogged down with like, oh, it does this, it integrates with this and that, but yeah. it's really <laughs> not what you should sell. What you should sell is like, what can I do in the end? What's How much time I'm going to save with my product? Like what I'm going to get in the end, in my day-to-day, how it's going to like affect my life 
at the end of the day, when I use your product, and this is really what you should sell. If you're selling something like about productivity, like and you're going to save them a lot of time per day, like if you tell them like at, at the end of the day, you're going to save like two hours, you're going to be able to have more time with your family, with your children. You're going to have more time to go to the gym. You're going to feel better. You're going to be more healthy because you can go at the gym now. They're going to say, God, what is that product? This tool. Interesting. Because now they can see the transformation. They can get the big benefit behind. And now they're going to say, yeah, that sounds interesting. Let me check it out. Instead of saying, yeah, it's going to integrate with your calendar. You're going to be able to do this and that. They don't care about that. Absolutely. You know, that is a very, very, very important point when it comes to positioning your product in the market. And, you know, there are two examples that I always remember whenever I'm creating copy for my products. I think of Gillette razors and car ads. These Gillette razors, right? It's usually not about the sharpness or the feeling. It's about the guy looking fantastic getting the girl you know succeeding in his career and, and have you seen those axe ads okay it's not about the smell it's not about the feeling it's about you know how all the girls swoon over the guy after he puts on the you know the axe uh, oh. fragrance car ads are the worst they don't talk about the, the features at all no no it's not about no. the features it's about how you feel driving the car it's like you know it's the success that or the success that people think you have when they see you driving the car you know like how you feel and that's when i when i started thinking wait a minute that is what gets people to take action like if, if i said my car is an automatic it can go zero to 60 in three seconds eh, great you know that sounds good but hey if that car can get the girl and your dream carrier like yeah, take my money, you know. That's when people actually open their wallets and pay. And personally, I've seen this in SaaS too. People think that, oh no, when it comes to SaaS, I have to talk about the fact that my product is AI powered. I mean, do you know my product can do this? Nobody cares. You know, Dominic was right. Oh, yeah. Nobody cares. Like, have, ask yourself, when was the last time you cared about what programming language SaaS was built on or what features it has? You bought that SaaS because it solved a painful problem and it, it elevated your status in society in some way. Yeah, I, I think we're emotional uh, creature. So you have to sell the emotion. If you're not doing that, you're, it's not going to work. So how are you going to persuade them that this is the right move to do to buy this product? Like I'm telling you, like when you sell a product and you sell a transformation, you're supposed to make them better at the end of the day. So if your product can do that, they, the product can make them feel better at the end of the day. You should, by all means, sell them as much as you can. Like you should push your product as, as far as you can go with it because you want to convince them. You want them to use it because their life will be better. If you have the cure to cancer, yeah. You're going to yeah. knock at every door like, and you don't care if people are bothered by you because you have this, the cure to cancer. You're going to do whatever you, you can to just sell Absolutely. that to people. And that's how you should see your product. So there's always a, a deeper meaning to your product. So for example, if you're trying to sell a SaaS product that is supposed to help a business make more sales, the business or the owner of the business, because that's the the owner that you're selling to usually is not looking to increase his sale. He's not in looking to increase the time he has in a day. No, what he's really looking for is something deeper. And that something deeper is like he wants to be seen as a successful business owner. He wants Absolutely. to be seen by his family as someone successful. He wants to be seen in the world as someone who's like doing something helpful for the people so this is yeah. something that's something deeper you have to sell to and that's the emotion you have to put in your product excellent point so guys when you're positioning your product don't talk about your features talk about their <laughs> futures right and make sure you tie it to an emotional high the reason why we are building SaaS is also there are emotional reasons why we're doing it like we want to be known we want our status in our society to increase similarly we need to figure out what it is that your customers want emotionally from or what is the emotional outcome or the emotional benefit or the status increase in their lives when they use your product 
And that, my friends, is how you position your product. That is where they will actually open up their wallets and pay you. Did I get that right, Dominic? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. That's You should always sell this way and then talk about your feature. Yeah, that's the, Absolutely. Uh, the, main, the main thing to remember. Yes. And uh, the most important thing you mentioned was the best way to not feel salesy about your product is to actually believe in your product. If you truly believe that you have a great product to sell, then it is your ethical duty to get it into the hands of as many people as possible. So I love what you said there, Dominic. You know, it's something I share with my students as well. But today, I think I hope they hear it again from another person who's done this as well, that it is your duty to make sure that the people whom you want to, or you whom you are called to serve find your product and benefit from it. The next one, and we mentioned that in the beginning, it's very important, is a uh, third topic, pricing. This is also like a way to position your product because pricing, yeah. it's not just like how much money you're going to make with your product, but it's also how people perceive your product. And mm. it's very important that, Usually when uh, I talk with SaaS founders, this is a typical mistake I see. They think that they're going to enter the market. They're going to position their product by being the cheapest. They're going to undercut the incumbent. And they're going to say, oh, they're charging like crazy prices. I don't know, $100 per month. And for us, we're going to go with 20 because we don't need that much. It, it's a classic mistake. And it, it's, mm. it's so, so wrong. It's so wrong on many regards. First of all, if you want to compete with the incumbent, you have to make money enough for you to survive. And usually if you price it super low, you're not going to survive. You don't have enough margin to sustain your business and to be able to hire people and to build more of your products. So it's really like shooting yourself in the foot if you're trying to price it lower. Still, you should always look to price higher. I, I remember reading somewhere, and I don't remember the, the person who said it, uh, but it says there is no advantage to being the cheapest or the second most priciest person in the market, but there is every advantage to being the highest priced product in the market. What people don't realize is that if you know all of your competitors charge 37 for their product, and you charge $9, they're not going to think, oh, it's cheaper. They're going to wonder, wait a minute, what's wrong with this product? What does it not have? You know, it's like, uh, it's like you go to a marketplace and you see Apple selling for $10 and then you sell it for $5. They're not going to say, aren't these both apples? And say, something's wrong with that Apple. That's why it's selling for $5, you know? So we're not going to buy that. So it's, it's again, the, understanding how perception works you know and i and i totally get it it is a classic mistake especially founders from you know developing countries make because here the cost to build SaaS is lesser than first world countries like americas and you know europe so we think that okay you know what we will charge lesser but i've now noticed dominic that a lot of companies in india and many other, you know, Southeast Asian countries, why should we charge any lesser? And so they charge a premium. And this is what I have noticed. And, you know, this is me having worked with, you know, a ton of corporates is that the quality of clients that you get when you charge higher prices are also much better than the quality of clients that you get when you charge low prices. When I started the Founders Club, Dominic, you know, I, I said my first cohort, I'm going to charge them 10,000 rupees. Uh, and then mm -hmm. I slowly increased the price. Now it's about 50. Uh, it's about, it's actually closer to 60,000 rupees in India. And uh, one thing I did see was the commitment of the students definitely has improved. I remember giving a few of them, you know, a free pass, like a scholarship. And guess what? Many of them didn't even you know, complete the course. Many of them didn't take it as seriously as the people who actually committed to the journey. So, reminder to everybody, you can define who you work with simply by raising your prices oh, and yeah. then using those prices to, uh, you know, build better products, making sure your business survives. In fact, that reminds me, Dominic, isn't this also a type of business model? What I mean by that is I've noticed Tesla, right they introduced a really costly vehicle first right the the roadster and that was what 250 grand or something like that and that yeah. was what they started with 
and that allowed them to build the company out and then offer more and more cheaper solutions to the general public. Have you seen this? I mean, is there a name to that business model? And have you? How does that? And, and can you explain that to our you know viewers? I don't know if there's a name, but the strategy is more like you go premium before you go for the the normal product for sure. Like it's how you enter a market. You're gonna sell to the the the, the biggest or most expensive market first, just to penetrate in the market. Because there's many advantages to that. First of all, you if you sell to people who have more money then you're more inclined to sell your product easily. You have less convincing to do because these people have the mean to buy it. But also, yeah, if you have more margin, you have more ability to build your company with that, that money. Like instead of like scraping by to pay your employee and you don't have a lot of margin, so you cannot reinvest in your company. If you have big margin because you're selling a premium product, then you can reinvest that into a different product that is low end or lower end, or you can just re like refuel your marketing to spend to more people or pay more employee in your company. So you're going to grow in the end. So, and this is what a business should strive to is to grow. So if you have more margin, you can do more with that money. So if you're selling a product, go premium first, because then you can do so much more. You can make your product better. You can hire more. You can sell more of it. So more people will benefit of it. So it's really a good positioning like strategy to make sure you're going to survive. And so now that we've understood, you know, the importance of pricing high and what's the next thing that we need to think of when positioning our product? Yeah, the next thing would be clarity, your offer. You need to make your offer super clear that people are going to understand and they know what they're going to get um, like when they pay for your product. And this is mm -hmm. usually something that most founder, when they start off, have a difficulty to articulate. They have a nice product, but how are they going to explain it in the market? How are they going to offer it, let's say, on a website? Or if you're going to build your audience on social media, how are you going to explain it on social media? How are you going to pitch it in one or two sentences that people are going to understand? And this is usually where I see especially SaaS founders, because usually they are developers and they have difficulties to put like the right words on a website. Like they can build product, but they're, it's not their strong suit to put that into word in a web page. And this is where I see a lot of mistakes to be done. The writing is usually not so clear. When you ask them what their product is doing, they cannot get to the pain point. They don't sell me the transformation. They explain me, oh, it's built with JavaScript. It's going to integrate with your this and that, but they don't explain what it's going to do for me. So this is really the next point is being clear about your offer and how you, you can pitch your product. How are you going to position it to someone who wants to know about your, your product? Okay. So clarity. So that's how it is. Clarity is the step where we make sure that what we, what the audience expects is clearly communicated to them. What are some tricks? What, what are some tips or tricks that I can, you know, probably leverage in order to be more clear? Like sometimes I can, I guess, you know, don't use jargons, you know, speak yeah. simple language, simple English, dumb it down, talk at a third grade or fifth grade level. What, what, what are some tips and tricks that you would say to help be more clear? Yeah, for sure. So, I guess there's many uh, components to being to clarity. One of the first one uh, that you always hear, it's about talk about the benefit and not what you, your product does. So if you want to do like a website, you want to explain what it does, I would say in the main title, you should say what's the benefit of it. Like you should, you should start forward with your benefit and not say like uh, we are SaaS doing productivity for engineers you should say like a benefit instead like uh i'm going to say something that you always hear it's probably not super good but save two hours when you code for your website right so mm -hmm. you, you you lean forward with the benefit of the product so that people can put themselves uh in their own environments okay so if i use this product it's going to allow me to do this so your main title should be about the benefit first of all and if you can add a second, a second tip, if you can add more specificity to it, if you can add numbers, 
if you can add um, what you're going to get with it, it's even more, it's better. It's more clear, yeah. clear what they're going to yeah. do with it. So numbers is one thing. Another tip I would say is to add curiosity in your, in your titles. One thing you can, you can say to speak about curiosity is if you're doing um, a blog article and you want to talk about the five tips on positioning, then you're going to say, here's the five tips to position your SaaS, right? You're going to mention that this is going to be what you're going to learn when you read this, this blog or this article. And you can do the same for your SaaS company on your web page yeah. or whatever you start a video. You can like build some curiosity into what they're going to learn in, in the web page or in the video you're going to discuss about. So specificity, curiosity, benefit. And also if you can add proof of it, like if you can add a testimonials or you can add some something that's going to attest to the benefit of your product. It's going to make it much more potent. People will believe it even more. So it speaks even more to the clarity of the benefit that you're trying to sell. So really benefit, curiosity, specificity, proof of concept is what you should add in your, um, in your sales pitch when you're trying to sell your product. Awesome. Okay. But I have one twist. Okay. We spoke about selling to people's emotions. Okay. And yeah. now we're talking about clarity. So how do we balance the two and how do we draw the line between being clear and being clever? Yeah. So how, how would, how would you balance the two? Or is there certain places where you have to sell to the emotions and certain places you sell, the, you talk about clarity? How that's now a little bit confusing for me. So help me out there. Well, yeah, you should never strive to be clever. You should always try to dumb down your idea to make it as if your your grandma is going to understand what you're selling. That's what you should strive for. So whenever you're trying to pitch something or you write down your your headlines for your website, it should be super simple. Like you should use like simple terms that everyone will understand. If you have to make people think about what it is, yeah, you're going to lose them. You're going to lose them. So it, sh it, it should be super simple in terms of, let's say, the copywriting. You should use simple words. Also, in terms of design, it should be super simple. What One headline, what's one sub-headline and one call to action, and that's it. You should really be super simple to the point and not be clever. That's what I will aim to do. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's clear versus clever. Always be clear. How do I figure out or decide when I should be talking about, you know, the the exact or being specific about the features or the products versus when I should talk about the, you know, the emotional benefits or the, the status improvement? Where how do I how do I figure out when I need to do either one? Yeah. Um so I would say it 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 depends. You should start by being simple being clear and if you want to add a second sentence to your pitch then you can start talking about the emotion you're going to say something like um i help developers save two hours when they develop their website and then you're going to add a second sentence and you can do uh, some kind of, of um, analogy you can say something like it's like uh, when you decide to uh go somewhere and instead of going by a walk you're going to take your car you want to go faster so you're going to use some kind of emotional analogy to make got them it, understand your, your product okay. better so this okay. is where so when, yeah that's so, that's interesting so always prioritize being clear and then you can augment it or supplement it with you know emotions and selling the futures am i am i getting that right yeah, you want to solidify the idea of your product, but you first need to explain what it is, like what you, you're selling. And after you can add all these emotional analogy, if you want, you can add it also in your, in your title, but you have to be cognition that if you, you're adding too much or too much emotion in it, you, you take the risk of being like too complex and people might lose you. So there's always a way to maybe do both. But mm -hmm. it becomes more difficult. So if you more like a, if you starting out, I would say stick to the basic. And if you want to be more uh, advanced, you can maybe merge the two together. But it become difficult to do. And it, especially if you let's say you, you're selling your 
your product to a cold audience, someone that doesn't know you, you need to be extra clear about them. And I, and this is when I will refrain from using like these analogy first of all, because they let's say you're doing some ads and they're going on your website, they need to understand what you're doing in like two seconds, one second. Mm. It needs to be super clear. And then you can go on to explain the emotion and all that stuff. But I would say stay away from being clever. Don't use slogan. And especially don't copy big brands. A lot of people will go and look at big brands' website and they're going to say, look, they're doing this. It's working fine. Or you're going to go on the, on Google and you're going to search like, yeah. what's the best landing page? What's the best website? And then you're going to see all these big brands with clever headlines, super short, super beautiful, well-designed. And you say, I want to do this. But what you forget is these people, they're known. People know them. And they already have a brand implemented. So they can, uh, they can like take more risk and put more emotion and put more something that is more subtle in their marketing campaign because they already build a brand. But when they started, they had to be super simple. And probably when they started, like so, some SaaS we know, Airbnb, Dropbox, they were doing the marketing on the one-on-one -on -one first. Mm -hmm. And so they were explaining the product to people they know with super simple term. It was about like share, uh, sharing files. It was about to find a place to live online. So yeah. they were super clear about their marketing. If, if when you start out and you copy big brands, you're going to get burned because it doesn't work with cold audience. It doesn't work with people that doesn't know you. Fantastic. Fantastic. So always strive to be clear. And I'm, you know, as I'm saying that I'm thinking about my own web pages, I'm like thinking, wait a minute, that, that, that lines over there could probably go away, disappear because it. It's not clear, you know, it's try, try, It's me trying to be clever. So great. So now we've spoken about clarity as well. What else? Yeah. So the last thing I put, it's number five. It would be test your idea and pre-sell your idea. So you want to, we talk about building your audience. We talk about selling transformation, selling future. We talked about pricing and clarity of your offer. Now it's time to test it to go in the market and try to sell what you have. And this is where I say pre-sell because I will highly advise you to sell your product before you build it, right? So you find your audience, you find how to pitch it, you sell a transformation. You should go out there and try to sell your product before you have finished building it. You can have an MVP if it doesn't take too long to make, but mm -hmm. I will highly advise to try to make some sell before it's even ready. And there's many advantages to this. Uh, the first one is, of course, you're going to validate if your product is good or not. If people want it, either they are willing to pay for it or not. But also, you're going to fund your own product. You're going to fund the development of your product, which is very important. You don't want to be building for two years and have nothing to show for it after once yeah. you try to sell it. So you should, and you're gonna build your audience also by doing this. So I think the last step is really to go out and to test everything we just mentioned. All the positioning points I just mentioned, you should go out there and test it. Absolutely, really well said, Dominic. You know, one of the things that uh, I teach in my cohort is also sell before you build. But why that's more valuable to hear today is because in the past people used to you know maybe sell and then they'd have to wait eight months for the SaaS to be ready but today thanks to low code and ai and so many templates out there you can sell this week and you can have a prototype ready by the next or you know in two weeks time so the, the time between actually taking somebody's money and giving them an mvp is also kind of like really shortened now so there is even, I mean, there is no more excuses for not selling first or using the selling phase to test your idea. Because if you can't get people to open up their wallets and pay you now, I mean, you're not going to learn some new skill after you build your product to get them to open up their wallet. Then you're still, you're going to have a product and still not be able to sell. So when you're trying to pre-sell your, your product also, I would say, yes, you have more tools to, to build it out, but you don't, and there's a lot of no-code solution out there, which makes the building a product 
way faster than it was before, but it could be as simple as you can build just a, a landing page and you, go, you can go out with your landing page and just add a payment gateway and ask people to pay for that, right? You, yeah. you don't have to build anything. Like the, the MVP stage is when you know people will, will pay for that product. And then you can use all these no-code tools to put it out together to build an MVP in a fast manner. But I think first what you should do is just try to go out there. You build your audience on social media. You talk with people in DMs and you just pitch your, your offer and you ask them, hey, would you be willing to be the first user for my product and I'm going to make you a deal for a membership for the whole year and give you a 50% off? Would you mm. pay for that? And when yeah. people are ready to, to make the, the jump and to give you money for your product that you're trying to sell, well, you know that you have something good right there. If they don't pay, then you have to maybe find somebody else to try to sell to because maybe it's not the right audience. But if they pay for it, you know you have a, the jackpot. It doesn't mean your product is going to be good now, but you know you have a good idea at least. And people are willing to pay for it before it's ready to be the first to use it. So I think this concept is really overlooked. And we hear all these, these mindset blockers saying like, yeah, I'm not sure if a landing page is enough to sell my product. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if my idea is really enough to, to sell it. And it's really all limiting belief. You should really do whatever you take to, you can to sell your, your idea, your product way before. And as soon as you have, uh, at least someone paying for that, then you know you have a, a, a good idea or you have in a good direction to, to start from. But if you don't have anyone paying for this, I will refrain from checking out these no-code tools and building something. I would say try to stay with a landing page first or your concept and go on social media and try to sell it before you do something else. Because I've done this mistake so many times. You build something, you think it's a good idea. People tell you, yeah, it's a good idea. They give their email address and you have a big waiting list. But if you don't pay for it, it, mm. it means nothing. Excellent point. Excellent point. Unless people are willing to put their money where their mouth is, you don't have a viable idea. Anybody is more than happy to give a fake email, right? But <laughs> getting them to say, here's my money. That's when you know you have something worth building. Otherwise, what you have is an opinion. You know, I'm so glad you said that, Dominic, because I think as builders, you know, uh, we immediately jump to the, the creation part of the process. Like that's where we find our, you know, our identities. Like I want to build, right? And, and we get into that, but we forget that in order to build a business, the first or the more important part of you know, this entire process is making sure that we speak to customers. We make sure that we have a valid idea. We follow the boring parts of the <laughs> business, you yeah. know, to uh, make sure that the idea is actually valid, but more importantly, viable. That's, that's very true. And I think a very, very important reminder for everybody who's watching, please take some time out to sell before you build. It will make all the difference later. Yeah. And you, you're going to also fund your business. Like, yeah. It, and, and I know it's the, it's the most, it's the, the, the part people fear the most to go and sell something that doesn't exist, but it's really the most important of all the points I mentioned. Cause if you, if you figure this one out, all the other points I just talked about are going to unlock themselves. So we're talking about building an audience. If you, a lot of time you're going to say, yeah, I want to sell my product before it's built, but to whom? That's mean you doesn't have an audience. If you don't have an audience, you probably don't have a go-to-market strategy. So you should go back to the drawing boards and build your audience first. And we, we often want to do, like you just mentioned, we want to jump into building because that's what's fun. It's fun building stuff. I agree. It's, it's nice, but you're not going to, you cannot skip every any of these points you still need to build an audience you still need to sell your product before it's ready so there's no shortcuts if you build your product you're going to have to do whatever we just mentioned all the points before you're going to have to do have to do them before anyways so you're basically losing time if you're doing yeah. this plus you don't validate your idea you don't have money to survive in between the time you build it so what you really want is to you want to raise money you mentioned at the beginning, don't go for VC funding. Well, I would say at least 
go for money that you sell your product before. Like <laughs> sell your product, yeah. raise money this way. That's what you should do. Because money, absolutely, you need it to build your product. So I would say, don't go for VC money, but go for product money. Sell it yeah. before it's built. Yeah. Please. You know, I like what you said about building it wrong means building it twice, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so it's very, very valuable to spend a little bit of time before building to make sure that you are building the right thing for the right people in the right space for the right reasons. You know, like it's the classical reminder, measure twice, cut once. Yeah. So and if, you, if you can't wait to build then do it like online, go on social media and build it in public. Yes. Tell people that you're, you're currently building this and ask feedback at the same time. If I you like do that. this, you're way more advanced than anyone. So if you can't wait to build, all right, but do it in public. Ask people the advice and sell it at the same time. Hey, you like it? Yeah, it's a cool idea. Would you be the first one to pay for it when it's, it's released? And then you can do all five points at the same time if you're impatient. Absolutely. Go ahead, do it in the public. Absolutely. And, and, I, and if I'm not wrong, there's a huge build in public movement on X. And if you, if you just search for the hashtag build in public, you'll see so many people sharing their day to day journeys, sharing their work, showing their work and, you know, going from there. And it, it's also interesting to see how many audiences and how many people uh, or the audience that they build as part of the build their you know build in public framework so that is a very very good point thank you dominic for raising that because it's a very very valuable way to build <laughs> and, and i say this because building is where the fun is you don't want to take the fun out of being your own boss so build definitely build but do it in public that's an awesome reminder to uh, dominic thank you so much so those were the five things about positioning and i think that really really gives everybody a framework to think about you know when building SaaS. and i just want to say dominic thanks for making it so simple thanks for making it so clear for us I'm sure that, you know, a lot more people, when they see this video live on YouTube or in, on other platforms, you know, having, they're going to have a lot of questions and I'm, and I would recommend them to ask those questions in the comments. Hopefully, Dominic, you will be around to help us answer those questions as well. If people want to learn more about you or work with you, where can they reach out? Uh, I'm mostly on X. So you can find that at Dominic Bouchard, which is my name. You can find me on X. And yeah, if you need any question um, on marketing, I'll be happy to answer any question you have. Just go in the DMs. It's public. You can uh, send me a message and I will reply in maximum a day. Amazing. All right. And we'll also leave links to Dominic's X account on the video description. So please make sure you go and find him, talk to him and follow him on X as well. Dominic, thank you so much once again for spending time with us. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to many more conversations like this in the future. And uh, I just want to say all the best for your uh, business as well. And uh, we will talk soon. Thank you very much. I also appreciate this talk and let's do it soon. Awesome.